What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Boo! Oh! Did I jump scare you? Not really. Oh. You tried, though. I tried. I think I, I I think I scared myself more than you. You probably scared Lucy, wherever she is. Yeah, I don't see her, so she must be scared. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, so we, we like to get scared together, and today we're going to talk about a very specific kind of scare, the jump scare. And if you're worried that I'm going to edit a jump scare into... Th- <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm truly not going to put jump scares in here no james don't make that face i'm really not i i'm not going to betray your trust like that because that would make me stop listening to a podcast if they <laughs> did that to me so that's not what's going to happen here we're going to talk about the, the jump scare why it works why it often doesn't work mm. why it's kind of a maligned technique i think in horror yeah. i think a, a criticism of especially modern horror is well it's all just jump scares Right. You always say you don't like jump scares. They're not my favorite, but when they're done well, I respect it. You've been doing research on them, right? I have been. I've actually been using, and you may recognize this website if you were at our live show at RTX. I've been using wheresthejump.com for the bulk of my research. And this is a great website that tells you what movies have jump scares, how many jump scares are in them, and the time codes at which the jump scare occurs and a brief description of what that scare is. It's very thorough. Have you gained any kind of respect for jump scares after doing research in? Yeah. And and I, I I guess to clarify, I never like, I, I hate them when they're not done with a sense of, purpose when Mm. they're not and we're going to talk about the difference between one that's staged well and one that is just you know there's nothing to it it's just kind of there to startle you and you're not really adding anything to the experience of the movie yeah but no some of my favorite scares in general are jump scares because when they're done well they stick with you and they're very memorable and i i think it's awesome i guess what's the difference between a jump scare and a regular scare a jump scare. So a jump scare is a. It's a Let's scare. Let's define our terms. Yeah, here. yeah. So it's a scare that is purposely a shock or a jolt, and it's usually accompanied by a loud sound. It's the sound that gets you. It is the sound. There's actually some science I put in here. Studies of of fear and fright and our our animal reflexes, and it's sound that is crucial for sure to there being a jump. And it really, yeah, it it sets off your your fight or flight. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've said it before. That's why so many people watch The Kill Count and is like, it. it you make scary movies not scary. It's because you're listening to me talk and like right. the cool, chill music underneath. It is why, and I, no shame in this, I will sit through entire <laughs> movies with my ears plugged mm-hmm. and I go through all the mazes at Universal with my ears <laughs> plugged also. I'm very sensitive to the loud sound aspect of a jump scare. I think that's what makes me not, love them yeah (laughs) because it really you you can't help it your your body is literally triggered to release chemicals that tell (laughs) you (laughs) to run or fight where's the jump.com actually made a graph they have i think like 250 ish movies on their website that they've gone through and listed all the scares and so they made a graph by decade how many jump scares average are in I know I'm looking movies. over there I'm seeing a bar graph and you know I love my my graphs and charts Oh yeah are you jealous you have a copy Yeah of I want to fucking look at this I'll graph. show it to you when I'm done with this page There's so many numbers <laughs> So uh and data This graph starts in the 60s but actually the first jump scare that we know of in film that I think many would agree is the first jump scare is in the movie Cat People, 1942. Have you seen Cat People? I've not. I've not seen any iteration of Cat People. I've only listened to the song Cat People, putting out a fire with right. gasoline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean that song just makes me think of Inglorious Bastards. That's true. But I fucking flipped out so hard in the theater when I that bet. song started. I've only seen the the version we're going to be talking about, the 1942 one. I've never seen the 80s iteration oh, okay. of it. Yeah, I've only seen the 40s one. Great movie, by the way. It's like 70-ish minutes. Nice. And it's about a woman who is a sexually frustrated panther. It's 
awesome. <laughs> There's a lot going on in that movie. That's why we we talked about it. And that I saw it in college. We took some time in our class to kind of deconstruct this movie because there's a lot going on with like female sexuality and repression and stuff it's good but so yeah in in the scene the main character is following her husband's assistant home because I think he like he's kind of freaked out by his wife because he senses something's weird so he's beginning to confide in this assistant so she's following her home and it's a very tense scene it's all these these cuts back and forth between feet and then all of a sudden a bus just kind of like pulls into frame and it's super loud to pick up the assistant and that's our first jump scare and it's you said this is widely agreed upon or yes often this, is, noted? this is very widely agreed upon and in fact it's it's the bus and that style of scare is that's where the term the loot and bus comes from i don't know if you've heard that before no but it is a specific style of jump scare that ever since this movie it's been used to describe a scare where it's there's a tense atmosphere but then something innocuous like scares you it's nothing that is actually scary or harmful oh okay so not final destination no 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 even though that's an actual bus, bus. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 that that does not quite fit the crate so does this, not have to be a bus this is probably uh applicable to scenes where it's really tense someone's like is there something out there and then an animal makes a noise like a cat yes. meows yep. or something like that mm-hmm. okay i think of um the there's a scene it follows where the ball the baseball gets thrown at a window she's yeah. like <laughs> that scared the shit out of me yeah it's actually a scare in that movie where i'm like you didn't need do we that. didn't need we this didn't need movie. that yeah exactly <laughs> but yeah and it's it's called the Luton bus after the producer Val Luton oh Val Luton yeah wow who was that's the character's name in Final Destination the teacher there you go Valerie Luton because all those characters are named after does she get killed by a bus no she's the one who uh the house and oh, the fire yeah, yeah, and the yeah, knife in the chest oh yeah. that's a missed opportunity yeah little... but that's funny yeah oh mm-hmm. <laughs> and then after that we don't really have jump scares in film that's not really a thing this is kind of a weird outlier even though it's the first it's not a thing that people are really copying or imitating i think the only thing that i would say is close ish to a a jump scare in films between then and the 60s is you have some like william castle is making stuff like the tingler and is basically doing a 4d jump scare where he's putting buzzers under seats and is trying to make you jolt in the theater members of the audience including you will actually play a part in the picture you will feel some of the physical reactions the shocking sensations experienced by the actors on the screen but then the next recorded jump scares are then the 60s with psycho and there's a few in that one we've got the detective or the private detective getting stabbed on the stairs by norman yeah. with that crazy shot where he's falling backwards down oh, the yeah. stairs and the end with the the mother in the chair getting spun around is kind of a jump the 70s they're used pretty sparingly but the ones the movies that do use them they stick out to me uh, texas chainsaw massacre we oh, have God. leatherface coming out of the Franklin's woods death. yeah yeah, yeah that that one. is a great it's jump. So it still good. gets me. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the end of Carrie. Oh, with the hand. Mm-hmm, the okay. hand coming out of the ground. Where's the jump.com notes? The only movies from the 70s, which by the way, it has an average of 5.6 jump scares. Compared to how many for 60s? 2.6. Okay. Yeah. So more than double. Yeah. The only, I guess, like notably jumpy movies are Halloween. Alien and The Exorcist. Are Alien's there. got that great one when uh, uh, Dallas gets killed. Mm-hmm. That, God, that's such a good. I I one of my biggest regrets uh, with the awards and kill counts is giving that one the dull machete. Ooh, really? Yeah, I don't know why I fucking did it, but I sh- like that jump scare alone. What would you have done otherwise? For otherwise, dull yeah, machete? I don't know. I, I mean, that's the thing with that movie is it's. They're all good. Yeah, maybe uh, Lambert mm. near the end there, mm-hmm. or uh, I forget who she's with who gets killed at that point, but those seem kind of low-key compared to that awesome jump scare. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. And then, yeah, the 80s is when we have a to- like a spike in jump scares, an average of 9.5 per movie. Oh, my God. And, yeah, that's when we get our slashers and the characters are getting killed suddenly. We're yeah. not... It, these aren't movies about... 
tension, suspense. Some of them are are good at that, but it's mostly they're they're for they're the sudden shock, and mm-hmm. that's what those are there for. And I can just fucking hear the the strings in the Friday the Thirteenth score. So then we move into the '90s, and this chart has an average of seven point nine jump scares in movies. So still a decent amount, but we're not as many because we're moving out of slashers. People are over slashers; they're done. But you have movies like Scream. Scream especially, I think, is the best example of this, where we're parodying things that were invented in the 80s and became popular and then overused in the 80s. So, like, the the one last scare thing, that's what that's the end of Scream. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. But then as a result of this kind of parody, we then further cement jump scares and specific types of jump scares as being cliche or uncreative and so they already in the 90s have this reputation of being a lazy way to scare your audience 2000s horror isn't really about jump scares either 2000s is when we get our our torture porn as many people refer to it sure yeah more focus on gore and realistic violence rather than a startle or a jump this is a quote from uh, C. Robert. I don't know if it's Cargill or Cargill. I've never actually heard his name said out loud. I've only read it, but he co-wrote Sinister and Doctor Strange. And oh. Sinister, we're going to talk about Sinister in this yeah. episode because fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have a quote from him that kind of, I think, really wraps up why. It, like 2000s to present, where we are now in terms of the type of horror we favor and the types of scares we favor and why it does seem recently that there are more jumps and things we think of all the blumhouse movies and those are just jumpy as shit and all the conjuring movies exactly yeah Yeah. jump scare factories he says we got sick of seeing teenagers strapped to chairs and having their eyeballs pulled out with pliers so what you have is all these people saying i don't want to see real monsters anymore i want scary monsters i want monsters that i can believe for an hour and a half exist and then walk away going oh no ghosts don't exist so we have moved into kind of a supernatural era of horror. We're really sure. into ghosts and demons and shit right now. And just because ghosts and demons don't abide by the laws of, of humans, they can be wherever they want, whenever they want. You, It's so much easier to write in creative jump scares for kind of demonic type characters because they can just literally show up wherever they want. Yeah, because if you think of the, you know, uh, quintessential torture porn series, Saw, I don't think there are a lot of jump scares in there. There's like, not How really... would you work that in? Yeah, I can only think of maybe a couple in that first one, but... Yeah, it's much more... Oh, the fucking camera flashing, which is actually very well done. Yeah, uh, yeah when he's using the camera flash to light his way through the dark apartment. Mm-hmm. But yeah, other than that, it's more about, like, the the gore, the, the makeup effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but now we're we're back in this this era of horror where we've got, I think people now really associate horror with jump scares. Yeah, they get a bad reputation, or at least those kinds of scares get a bad reputation, and uh, I think that's because they are often used as a cheap way to scare people instead of it, it's much harder to build tension that's then released with a scare. It's easier to like we've complained about in the ghost paranormal activity ghost dimension so many of those scares are just they're just kind of there you know there's not there's not an obvious build up to a scare you're just getting startled and that's not really much fun yeah or even if there is a bit of a build up with the like oh is is something bad gonna happen when it's something so innocuous that happens it's like well that was just scary because of the way they filmed it and did the sound design like if it's someone opening a door and just being like oh hey just me, the neighbor, looking for coffee or something like that. It's it's startling, but mm-hmm. then you're like, "Come on, fucker! That did, you didn't right. need to do that." And so I actually want to read this quote from Alfred Hitchcock. Speaking of Psycho, and I think maybe because the the scares in Psycho are so well done, and they are some of our earliest jump scares, I think he had such a good handle on how to effectively build that tension. And is he, this the suspense yes, versus? It is, yes. uh, what is it? Um, it's, it's suspense versus surprise, I think. Uh, yeah, suspense and surprise. But so if if you've gone to film school or (laughs) you are a writer or you've, you've heard this quote before and it is ironically a cliche to use this (laughs) quote to study and talk about suspense. But I think if you haven't and you're not as familiar with, 
um, like Hitchcock himself and his filmmaking techniques and his personality. This interview is so, I think, eye opening and I think helps to explain what makes an effective jump scare. That's not what he's talking about here, but I think the same principles can apply. And I do have a clip. It's from an AFI seminar that he he did. Four people are sitting around the table, five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. But the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information that in five minutes' time that bomb will go off. You've got the audience working. I think that even though he's talking about suspense versus surprise, I think that that really hits on what makes an effective jump versus one that makes you feel cheated after it happens, one that feels cheap and and one that earns jump scares this reputation of being lazy and not actually scary. They're just loud and therefore you have no choice but to be startled. Yeah, biologically. <laughs> right. And and speaking of the, the you know, biology of a, a jump scare and what's going on in your body and explaining why some you feel cheated and some feel lazy mm-hmm. because we are we're animals and our our brains get triggered when we hear a loud sound yeah. and i guess this is the uh, let me see i have an interview here from it's christian grillin who this was an interview he did with inverse but he's a psychophysiologist at the national institute of mental health and he says the best way to evoke a startle response is with a sound but touch or flashes of light work too so we think the tingler william castle or mazes at <laughs> horror nights or other oh yeah. yeah 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 i mean not so much touch but definitely the the lights flashing lights and sounds exactly The impact of a startling stimulus depends on two physical characteristics, its intensity as well as its so-called rise time or how sudden or powerful the stimulus is. A shotgun or a door slamming will make you startle, but a plane that takes off will not because the intensity of the noise only increases gradually. And apparently studies show that anticipation, so knowing that something is coming, does not stop you from jumping. You're not able to safeguard yourself against it. It often just makes it worse because you're anticipating it and you're getting yourself psyched up. Hmm. How does that square with his uh, saying that like a plane taking off? Because it's the the plane taking off is not oh, the build not, up. Oh, it's not a gradual and then big thing. Exactly. It's a gradual that it's just a, stays it's gradual. A, it's a sound that just gets loud, you know, so there's no shock or surprise. Yeah, there's no like big break from mm-hmm. the build up to a uh, hit. Yes. Yes. So okay. even even if you are, so let's say um, you are in a situation where, again, it's the difference between a surprise. So a surprise, you it comes something comes out of nowhere. You're not expecting it. These these emotions and these these brain chemicals are still getting activated. But when you are aware something scary is going to happen and you get startled, your awareness and you're therefore almost you're protecting yourself. You're bracing yourself for that. That does not help. Apparently it often. Yeah, it just it makes it worse. Apparently when you this is a quote, when you're hyper vigilant, you activate your amygdala and that's the part of your brain that f- deals with fear and yep. anxiety and apparently a neurotransmitter called glutamate then carries that signal deeper into your brain and that's what causes you to jump. It's a freeze. He also says, uh, quote, in my lab when I make subjects anxious and then I startle them, the startle reflex can be increased by 100 to 300%. And apparently people who are chronically anxious, such as myself, and this might explain why I don't like jump scares because I do struggle with anxiety. People who are anxious are just more easily startled in general because they are always in a state of being hypervigilant. That tracks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the common jump scare techniques. These are all from where's the jump.com. They have a list of commonly used uh, scares, tropes. These are ones that are overused, I would say. They okay. can still be done well. I think there's there's examples of each of these that are good and yeah. that are classic, but these are often the kinds that when you see the setup for them now, you know what's coming 
and they're predictable. How many are there? Do they have on their, their Why website? Why do you want to try and guess? How, kind of, yeah. Okay, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight types. Okay. And they're not all encompassing. These are sure. ones where they're like, these are our most common. These are the trends we see. I, I wasn't sure if it would be like eight, like a manageable number, or if it'd be like TV tropes where it's just like endless no, amounts no. of different, like very specific no, no, things. No, no, no. Okay. Do you want to try and guess what kinds of... Uh... Sure. Okay. Uh, I mean, we have discussed this a little bit. I haven't done any research, but I know that uh, a mirror, like closing the medicine yep. cabinet in the bathroom and something the being behind the mirror. mirror scare, yeah. The mirror scare. Okay. Um, we can talk about we'll, we'll talk sure. about them as you as you kind of guess. Or yeah. mirror scare if you're not familiar, or you're just you know you're blanking on what this could possibly be. We've got they say there's two basic setups to a mirror scare. One of them is a a mirror that is like a swinging medicine cabinet that when the mirror door is shut. That reveals that there's something behind our main character or whoever's looking into the mirror. And uh, our second setup is the camera cutting away from a mirror or panning away and then coming back. And then there's something in the mirror. Yeah. So my examples for this, I by the way, I had to have our moderators help me with this because... It's surprisingly hard to just think of examples of these. Yeah, because you asked me, and I was like, uh, I don't know. It's and hard I to just spend kinda, every day right. pouring over horror movies. Um, what I was able to think of was just the entirety of Candyman. <laughs> Candyman <laughs> is mirror scares. Yeah. And again, like I said, even though we're using this list of of maybe cliche scares, Candyman's a movie that does it well. It makes sense for that character. <laughs> yep, it's kind of necessary. It's very, yeah, it's necessary. <laughs> the Conjuring 2 has a good mirror scare. This one's kind of a slight variation on the setup of these, which maybe makes it a little more creative or puts a fun twist on it. But it's Lorraine looking at a, a giant, like, full-length mirror in the basement. And she sees Valak, the nun, standing behind her and so she looks and then the camera pans back there's nothing there then she looks and the camera pans back again to the mirror and Valak is like literally there and not in the mirror Valak is just standing there oh, in front okay of her, which yeah. I think is a cool little twist that's a good variation it, yeah. yeah um what else do you think we have here oh boy um is there one where someone's looking uh maybe following a trail or something they're following something that's leading their eye and then something pops up uh before you ex before the expected like end result of that trail ooh interesting i don't know if that makes sense if i'm conveying mm, that I, idea i i get what you mean it's weird i we kind of have the reverse of that the delayed scare yeah okay so yeah they like they they have a flashlight maybe and they're looking around a room and they land on something kind of spooky looking and they're staring at it and then something happens. Is that this kind of scare? Yeah, this is more, um, the delayed scare is more, you set up a pattern in your film where you get the audience to sense when the camera's here or set up this way, I'm safe. You're not necessarily thinking that, but subconsciously. So let's say, so daytime is often, we feel safe during the day. Mm -hmm. An example of this is actually just all of Final Destination, the franchise, <laughs> where a character avoids death and we think, okay, that. We're good. Okay. But then they're killed seconds later. It's yeah, a delayed... and the sequels really ham like do that a lot, right. uh, especially right off the bat in that first sequel when the guy escapes his house fire only to slip on the spaghetti and the ladder falls. Yeah, his eye. yeah, yeah. Or actually, oh it, it falls and stops, and yep. he's like, "Whoo!" And then it falls. Exactly. And kills him. Okay, yeah. so that's a good example. Hey, you want to talk about our sponsors this week? Hello Fresh. Hello. Fresh. Fresh. <laughs> HelloFresh makes cooking easy. It's a meal delivery kit. You get all the ingredients delivered to you. Yeah. Because I'm bad at grocery shopping. Yep. And it's hard to try and eat fresh when you have to then buy fresh ingredients and then just watch as they go bad. Oh, it's Isn't that so sad? It's the worst. And yeah. you feel bad when you it happens. You have such ambitions. <laughs> yeah. You buy a bunch of different produce and you're like, I'll come up with ways to use them. And yeah, they sit won't. in your fridge. You, you won't come up with And then you toss ways. them out yeah. and they smell bad. But luckily, HelloFresh sends you meals that you have all the ingredients and they are all measured so that you're not going to have food waste. Yes, those pre-measured awesome. ingredients. They got the proportions. You don't even have, you don't even have to break out 
your teaspoons and tablespoons and cup measurements, man. Exactly. It's got you taken care of. Yeah. And my other favorite thing about it is the fact that it it gives you a meal to make. You don't have to. That's the problem with us is being like, I'm hungry, but I don't know what to eat. And mm -hmm. this just gives you some options and you, you, you get the recipe and that decision is made for you. Yeah. It's great. And I everything they've sent us, I really liked. They have vegetarian meal options, which is what we get. We get their vegetarian yep. meals, which is great. And those are all really varied and good, too. It's not just all salads. Because <laughs> for some reason, people think vegetarians all just really like salad. I don't like salad that much. Although sometimes we'll get salads from HelloFresh and I, I like them <laughs> because they have stuff in them. Yeah. You know, they put a lot of, a lot of good stuff in those. A lot of fresh ingredients in them. Yeah. It's not just iceberg lettuce. And that's no. It. The iceberg lettuce is a sham. It's water. It's water. <laughs> it's crunchy water. <laughs> so if you want to try HelloFresh, you can get $80 off your first month by going to HelloFresh.com slash deadmeat80. That's Dead Meat, like the show, and eight zero, and enter the code Dead Meat eighty. So once again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Dead Meat eighty promo code Dead Meat eighty. Yeah, for eighty dollars off, it's like getting so... eight meals for free. You want to try HelloFresh one more time? HelloFresh.com slash Dead Meat eight zero promo code Dead Meat eighty. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, what else do you... Okay, I, I just thought of one that we did discuss previously, but that everyone is familiar with. It's someone's in a car, and it's a shot of them like uh, from like the driver's side to the passenger side, a sideways shot, and you're driving down the road, and then, oh, car out of nowhere. Car out of nowhere, or even the if, if the car is just sitting there. And someone comes and taps on the car. Oh, okay. Does that count in the same category? Yeah, I think okay. I think actually that's more primarily what they're talking about. Oh, here. okay. So it's. I think that one. Uh, I I think Creep had one of those mm -hmm. where the guy mm -hmm. was like at the guy's house and waiting yeah. for him, and then friggin' what's his Mark name? Mark Duplass. Yeah, I don't Mark remember Duplass. His name <laughs> in that. Yeah, exactly. These are often fake out scares too, where the person knocking on the car window or if it's not a person it's an animal but it's something friendly it's not yeah. any it's just it's, it's not there to startle us exactly so my my examples are scream randy popping out uh up outside Cox's, of gales yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah is that her news van he's uh yeah he's, she's in her news van trying to get some help and yeah, yeah randy pops up yeah yeah she beats and, him with her phone yeah <laughs> And the beginning of Urban Legend, the gas station attendant played by Brad Dourif yeah. pops out outside of a car window. All right. What else? Oh, man. Uh, uh, give me a hint. This, one of these has to do with something I just said last night that is when I can't watch in horror movies. I, I always look away. Oh, eyes? Yes. It has to do with eyes. Okay. But... Well not necessarily eye trauma. It's just this is like the eyeball. I don't know. What's up? The peephole scare. Pe oh, okay. So what? Someone looks through a peephole and then something pops yeah, up? Something's okay. there. I always get I get anxious. Yeah, when anyone looks through a peephole. But often in, in these movies, there is like eyeball trauma because of peephole. So I think of the second saw movie isn't mm -hmm. there someone looking he gets shot in the fucking face yeah and then like three movies later you see him set it up yeah <laughs> yeah exactly uh but this one is is more so it's someone looking through a, a peephole and then we see what they see it's their pov and something fucking pops up yeah and it's yeah it's usually nothing at first it's just an empty hallway and then something pops up. yeah mm -hmm. I, uh, an example one of the mods gave us is autopsy of jane doe oh. there's like a good one of these with her she just like in front yeah. Of it. What else do you think we got on this list? Um, damn. Let's see. Uh, we can't always talk about one that I said is like a hallmark of '80s horror, which is the the killer's not really dead. Okay, yeah. Which that's, that's one of the eight. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's our. You know, we think we've killed the killer, but we haven't. Of We're course. setting up for one last scare and maybe some sequels. So end of Friday the thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> infamously. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Child's play. 
that happens too. Just fucking child's play happens like three times. It does, yeah. <laughs> this one's called the fridge scare, but I think this can be a fridge or a door or it's it's a sideways shot of our character who is looking in either a fridge, a cabinet, whatever. But we're not seeing what they're looking at in the cabinet. It's just why are we shooting this from profile? Oh, because something is hiding behind like she's gonna close the door and something is behind it oh okay yeah that is similar to the mirror one yes okay yeah so, only yeah. it's not something appearing in the mirror behind them it's just something is literally standing by the door but where's the jump points out and i think that this makes <laughs> sense and actually made me kind of laugh these scares are one they're easy to see coming because the setup is so goofy like the motivation of it is weird why are we looking at this character from profile why are we not looking at what they're looking at why aren't we seeing the contents of whatever they're looking in? Is the other thing that the character would see? Yeah, the character be would there? see whatever is going to be there. And they would hear. So their example they gave <laughs> is there's a scene in The Purge where Lena Headey is scared by her son. But it's she would hear her son, you know, like yeah, you would hear up. whatever. And that's why when we talked about supernatural movies and ghosts and stuff, that's why I think movies like that use so many more jump scares because you can choreograph them and they can make sense because it's a fucking demon. It's like, a fucking ghost, whatever. You're not going to hear the demon show up. Although I think it's funny that assuming we're watching, you know, quote unquote real life, it's not a movie. Like this is what's something actually happening that the demon's going to wait till someone shuts a door there to pop up. Like, who are you doing that for? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the false awakening scare where you think, so maybe we've had a dream sequence or Ooh, something okay. and the character wakes up in bed and then they roll over and there's a fucking corpse or a whatever next to him. I even thought of that thing in Ernest Scared Stupid that so many of you submitted for the <laughs> Childhood Fears episode, that fucking the goblin or whatever that's in yeah. the bed, or the troll. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, but uh, I thought of the, the end of Phantasm because we think, did he just wake up and what's happening? Mm -hmm. The tall man pops out and grabs Jody. Boy. Uh, or Jody's not the boy. Jody's the brother, right? Is it Mike? Yeah, Mike. Or is it Jody? I oh, no, like, Jody is the brother. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And there's a ton of these in the first season of Haunting of Hill House. Just oh. Just like bed scares. People laying in bed and they roll over and the wife is all zombified. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's so much in that in that show. Can we um uh if you haven't seen that show, I suggest skipping forward. Skip like 30s. I know exactly what you're going to talk Cause about. Cuz I want to talk about one of the best jump scares ever. Yeah. Skip ahead yeah like a minute. Yeah, okay. Don't do ruin that. it for yourself. Yeah, for <laughs> real. This, it's the, this one made of the me best jump scares my ever. Pants. For <laughs> like, real, yeah. That fucking car scare yeah i forget which episode it's in it's funny i was i was googling that scare because i was curious what people had to say about it in researching this episode and i found a a, a debate over it on reddit where people were saying it's cheap there's no build-up it really does come out of nowhere which it, it does it i mean it comes out of nowhere but it's a jump scare but it also when you kind of look at why she does it and what's going on in that scene there is build up there it is motivated yeah because i think is the key to, exactly and yeah. that's what she she wants them to focus on you know it makes her her snap and she screams at her sisters and so there is i think that's what makes it um work for me and doesn't make it feel not earned is because you already feel tense on a different level you feel tense on like a character level right an emotional these, level yeah. yeah that these sisters are like uh, at odds with each other and arguing and right. yelling at each and other. And that is what motivates the scare to happen. It doesn't actually come out of nowhere, even though in the moment it feels like it. Yeah. And oh I actually screamed. Yeah, we screamed. It, oh, it was so fucking good. It's Rarely does a jump scare happen where five minutes later, I'm still feeling the effects of it. That, I'm trying, <laughs> like, I can think of the few where <laughs> that and sinister the very end of sinister just all of sinister <laughs> god damn thanks scott <laughs> yeah jesus yeah man yeah is there okay is there a category similar to that last scare in sinister where it's like a camera is just resting on innocuous action and then something jumps right in front of the camera no there's not the last one a, we have is an animal scare where that's kind of a it's the loot and bus it's it's the, same. the innocuous yes, scare. Exactly. okay yeah which is like uh one of the mods said a quiet place 
Yes, the, the raccoon. raccoon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have that example on here. Mm-hmm. It is interesting to then go and think about jump scares that are effective and or ones that you like and realize that often the ones that you like or that you think are cool don't really fit into any of these. Yeah. That's because they're fine. unique and I wonder what the infamous Jaws jump scare might be closest I to I am category. shocked that and I'm going to check, but I don't think that was on this list of best ones. What? Because that's a great one. Holy shit. So, I mean, this isn't going to be all, it's their opinion. Yeah. Man. And, and, uh, Steven Spielberg spent so much time to perfect that jump scare. He it got, re- I mean, he reshot <laughs> it because it just wasn't scary enough in test screenings and they reshot it in Verna Fields' swimming pool That's back right. in Los Angeles, and they shot a bunch of different uh, timings of it, of it happening, mm-hmm. and then went through and cut them all together, and then we're like, which one do we feel evokes the I, biggest scare? I love it. I love, too, that they filmed that in an editor's pool, and I <laughs> yeah. love, because an, an editor is what's going to often make or break your scare. For sure. Yeah, she worked right exactly. alongside with him to perfect that scare. Exactly. Editors, man. <laughs> All those like Verna Field and, and Thelma Schumacher and Sally Mankey are like why I learned how to edit in film school. Just Who's all- the middle one? Thelma Schumacher. Uh, she edits like all of Martin Scorsese's stuff. Oh, That's okay. That's she was, yeah. And then Sally Mankey was uh, Quentin Tarantino's yeah. before she passed. Very young. Like, it was just a freak accident. Oh, really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Sucked. Uh, do you want to try and take a crack at what you think they listed as the top jump scares just in horror? Oh, man. Okay. Uh, well, the Jaws one's not in there. It's not in there, but... But this is in horror, so we're still not talking about our favorite jump scare? No, we're not talking about our favorite jump scare yet. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Well, after this list, yeah. we'll we'll reveal what we think has a I mean, if people follow you on Twitter, they If probably people follow know. me on Twitter, they figured it out, but I think this one is an <laughs> underrated one and even in our history of jump scares, we talk about movies like Cat People. There might be one that came even earlier in film than I <laughs> Yeah. Than Cat. Was that earlier than uh, Shit, I forget what year. Pretty, it was around there. I forget if it was 30s or 40s. Same. Yeah. Either way, phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think we got? And I'm oh, gonna. Oh man, uh, Halloween. No, not Halloween. Shit. Okay. We were just talking about one of these films as one that like fucked us up. Sinister. Yes, yeah, Sinister. Do you know what scare in Sinister? Oh, man, I want to say the the last one, but it's probably it's not, not the last one. Is it the the kid behind him when he like the mm. the dead kid? You're missing. You're missing like the scare, man. The scare. Yeah. Oh, the lawnmower. The lawnmower and sinister Fuck is one yeah. of their top jump scares of all time. This is a, it's, it's like Ethan Hawke watching these tapes. These old nasty the looking old, nasty home tapes, videos. Projector. You got the clicking of the projector. One of them's called lawn work, and it's someone like just fucking running a lawnmower. All you really see is grass, and then it's like if someone was uh, uh, running a lawnmower and holding the camera and just looking down at the lawnmower. at the lawnmower while it's mowing the grass, and then mm. it like all of a sudden there's a fucking tied up person there, and it like it's so loud, and it like. That like I I don't know that made me like oh it's so good it's very good that movie does jump can I say that so you well. you met the director the other day yeah I'm very sad I was I could not go to the it premiere I had mm-hmm. a podcast to edit I take my work seriously <laughs> but uh I'm very sad I wasn't there because I wanted to just tell him how much that movie fucked my shit up yeah and Bagul I'm genuinely very afraid of Bagul. He's like like now I'm now I'm cool with the nun because mm-hmm. me and the nun have like learned to get along and we like each other. Yeah, but Bagul genuinely. Do I need to get a portrait of Bagul to hang up? To, yeah, to I need to him for you. Me, I need to meet who plays Bagul and like realize that that's a person. Honey, nobody plays Bagul. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, but ghoul's too scary for me. Yeah, that is one thing that I didn't realize that Scott Derrickson is directing the Doctor, Doctor Strange, Strange sequel, which is purportedly a horror a movie. A horror movie. Guy did Sinister and he did Exorcism of Emily Rose. That's right, yeah. So Him and uh, 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 who I just quoted, Robert oh. Cargill. Did he write it? Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, you know, we we're not huge Marvel fans the in this thing apartment, is, is, but it's, I might have to check. It'd that be one hard out. for me to. I just couldn't cover a Marvel movie because beyond like, oh, it's a horror movie, but also I'm gonna have to know about the fucking lore and stuff. Right, that's, that's where I don't care. Yeah, it's that's nothing why... to do with the people making it, but it's just the overall experience of it having to fit in with a universe that I don't. Care. Yeah, when people tell me to cover them, I'm like, the you reason can't. you like kill counts is because I know, you know so what much you're about horror. About. I exactly. know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't know what the fuck I was talking or about. Or like anime. It's like, we don't know those worlds. We, don't, yeah. we know horror. Yeah. Sorry. Right. <laughs> what else do we think we got? Let me give you maybe a hint. Oh, yeah, please. Um, Sinister, I often mix up with this Insidious? movie. Insidious. <laughs> what do you is think? It, is it Darth Maul? Yeah, it's Darth Maul. It's okay. the, the red demon face, the lipstick demon, if you will, mm-hmm. popping up behind Patrick Wilson. Yeah. It's so funny because rewatching that movie and always seeing stills of that part because it's so infamously great. Yeah. I haven't seen that part out of context so many times. As soon as we got to the scene where that happens, I knew what it was because Patrick Wilson is standing in front of this like painting and I'm like, oh, fuck, it's that painting. That guy's going to pop out any second. Even then, it's still fucking scary. Like we talked about knowing that something is going to happen. Yeah, that's true. But also, that is kind of the the rare example of one that is a great scare, but it kind of almost feels like it comes out of nowhere. Although I guess in that scene, he's talking about the demon and having dreams with it. So that almost is like the the delayed scare-ish where you feel safe because... We're watching him tell a story, and up to this point, we haven't had a demon in, like, the real world yet, you know? So that shot of Patrick Wilson feels very safe, but then it's not. <laughs> then it's not. The Exorcist 3. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? What scene? Yes. Oh, God, it's in the hospital. Yeah, it is. Holy shit. I remember I had this movie on kind of in the background while I was setting up the office uh, when we first decided to work from home, and... <laughs> Man, I am so grateful that that was a scene that I randomly decided to pay attention to because holy shit. Yeah. Someone, it's like a, someone's walking. I think a nurse is walking and then someone just appears behind them. I Maybe with a knife. It's with, I think a pair of scissors. It's, okay. Yeah. Oh. It's just like long, it's a long shot to the point where you're watching it and thinking, okay, I'm bored. Like <laughs> cut. <laughs> and then it just does a, I think a crash zoom and there's someone behind her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good shit. Mm-hmm. Good shit with that. This neck, this scare. And I think this will be the last one I make you guess. And I'll just kind of tell you what the rest of is them it the thing? are. It's not the thing. No. This one is a movie that genuinely scares me. You haven't covered it yet, but I know you're going to actually, I think soon you said maybe. Genuine. Oh, the descent. The descent. Yeah, it is soon. Do you know what part of the descent? Ooh, oh, is it the beginning? Not the beginning, but that, that fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that also sucks a lot. Oh, is it the the night camera on the, the, night the cam. video camera? Oh yeah, there's like the group of the girls and someone's filming with the night camera, and one of those things is yeah, the night vision. Yeah, stand. That's I watched that movie. Right around when it came out, I would have been in high school at a friend's house, and I I did not sleep that night. And yeah. I rem- I remember that scare so vividly because that oh, oh I hate those things. I hate night vision. I hate. Oh, oh, it's so <laughs> I'm so scary. excited to cover that. So the next, I'm just gonna run through these real quick. Okay. Um, American Werewolf in London. The fa- that's a false awakening. That's like a prime example of there's a dream and we think we're safe, but then um his face looks all scary. In the hospital. Yeah. Then the ring, the cut to the girl in the closet. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Which was something that they came up with in editing, Yeah, I guess it was an editing thing. They just put that there, and it's great. The conjuring, the hand clap in the dark. Beautiful. I love that scare. It's so simple. Seven, the sloth scene where they think that they found a dead body, but he's not oh, dead. Okay. It's been a while since I've seen Seven. I'm yes, realizing. Yes, sloth. I don't remember. That one I also watched at a sleepover. <laughs> in high school. I think that was the last time I've seen it. The only uh, death that I can recall from that movie is the glutton one, which is, I where think, he, the first one. he eats one. himself to death. Yeah. It's like beans, I think. I oh, fucking, ugh, it's fucking yeah. disgusting. That, I remember the, the lust one. Um... This one, I think, is the one where they walk in and there's, like, air fresheners everywhere. The, like, pine tree air fresheners are hanging up everywhere. And 
this guy is just like in bed that dying. sounds familiar repulsion which i actually haven't seen oh is that That's another polanski, polanski. is yeah. that part of his apartment trilogy or no Oh, that's a good question. I actually don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's that's a mirror scare in that okay. movie. And Prince of Darkness, which is a John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, there's a another false awakening in that too. It's a dream sequence until it's not. So the thing's blood test scare wasn't in there? But that's, there's so many jump scares. You know, I at a certain point you gotta take a list like this is this is maybe the editor's favorites. Sure. Because it's hard to compile a list of the best because there's plenty. Like, okay, so one of my favorite jump scares is in Argento's Deep Red. Do you remember, Do you know what I'm talking about? Is it the puppet that comes <laughs> the fucking out? Fucking puppet. <laughs> there's, it's like, and this is one I think is so well choreographed and shot and just everything about it I think is so neat. And that really stuck with me the first time I saw that movie. We have a character who... You know, we've got the tens, we got the goblin playing. It's like, ding, 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 ding. so there's something that's going to happen. We're getting all tense and it's being ramped up. And there's a guy who he turns and looks at this. It's a wall where there is like a door. And so you're looking at that. But then on the other half of the screen, this tiny door opens up and this fucking puppet just wheels out and is, he's laughing. And it just like, it just like, was so weird. And the misdirect is so good because you're genuinely not looking where this little guy pops out. Yeah. And speaking of jump scares that are effective because of the misdirection of mm -hmm. making you think it's going to be one way, but then it's not. I just got a shout out and this isn't a sponsored thing or anything. The fucking look see. By our boy Landon, mm -hmm. that like that's what drew me to the look see to begin with is the fact that it's has so many jump scares. It's it's just jump scares essentially. Yeah. But they're all so well they're done. They're really well done. Because yeah. yeah, like I'm just thinking of uh, as an example in the second season, which I am in, <laughs> is uh, when my buddy is sitting in the tent and he sees the silhouette of uh, look see's legs walking alongside the tent and the camera pans along with it and then it reaches to where the tent opening so you'd expect it to step out in front but nothing happens and the guy's like what and then looks he's right next to him it's a very good oh man yeah 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 it's i think it's it's harder than anyone gives it credit for to make a good jump definitely because it's very easy to go back to what's what's been done before what's proven to work and then just do that and then that becomes predictable and not scary exactly yeah mm -hmm. um but i think we both agree and now it's time to talk about a jump scare that i think is completely batshit insane i don't know it it's i Okay. Why don't you just edit it in right now? No, I'm not going to do that. It's <laughs> too on. loud. It's so loud. It's so loud. And also, if you're listening to just the audio of this, it would be really dumb. <laughs> because you wouldn't have any reference for what the fuck's going on. In the film Citizen Kane, which is probably the last movie you were expecting <laughs> me to mention in this episode, there is a legit jump scare in it. And Orson Welles himself claims... It was supposed to be a jump scare. Yeah. But also Orson Welles was like king of the trolls while he was alive. Um, uh. him, oh, oh, the French champagne. Yeah, he, he was always kind of fucking around with people who interviewed him. And he was a very funny person. <laughs> but there is a scene in Citizen Kane where, it, I mean, this is in like the last stretch of the movie, maybe like three quarters of the way through. It's a long movie. And it's after a very talky, quiet scene. There is a cut to this fucking white cockatoo and it's keyed in and the key is fucked up so that its eyeball is also see-through, making it just more of a nightmare. This bird just shows up on the screen and just... Ah! <laughs> and it's so loud. It's mixed so fucking it's loud. so loud. And then it just... That, that's it. That's it just it. fades, it, it, and then we're on to the next scene. It is so weird. And so I found an interview with him. This is from uh, the book, this is Orson Welles, which uh, Peter Bogdanovich, who, the director, Peter Bogdanovich, who keep an eye out for him in It Chapter 2, by the way. That was a weird little cameo. Oh, is he the director, the director in the movie? Yeah. Oh, that's so yeah. funny. Yeah. He was at the, the premiere. Oh, I know. shit. 
I'm sure he was yeah. un- untouchable. He's fucking <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich. But uh, so this is an interview with Orson Welles and Peter Bogdanovich. He says, why did you use that shrieking cockatoo? <laughs> Wake him up. Literally? Yeah. Getting late in the evening. You know, time to brighten up anybody who might be nodding off. It has no other purpose. Theatrical shock effect, if you want to be grand about it, you can say it's placed at a certain musical moment when I felt the need for something short and exclamatory. So it has a sort of purpose, but no meaning. And there's also, he was on the Dick Cavett show where Dick Cavett asked him about this. So I'll just put the clip in here. It's funny. Everybody remembers that one scene where you suddenly cut to a cockatoo screeching just before... That was to wake up the audience. (laughs) It's as That's the as entire that. significance of the cockatoo. I just can't get a, pre- <laughs> I can't get a pretentious answer out of you. I guess he did say that the weird key of it, where its eyeball is see through, that was just a genuine fuck up. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. But it's great. And Citizen Kane is 1941. So 1941. 41, okay. Wow. Man. Yeah. I mean, that fucking movie. It sounds dumb to be like, it's great, check it out. But Citizen Kane genuinely plays like something that feels more modern it's so than good. it is. It's fucking great. I mean, it's great. It's, so fucking it's great cliche, for a reason. But, it's so good. but I, it genuinely sometimes you you know, there's movies that are are great and they're great for a reason. But you know, they're they're films and they can be. I wouldn't just recommend them. Sure. As like, oh, go watch this. It's fun. When a lot of those are not fun, even though they're classics. But Citizen Kane is great. Like, yeah, it's funny. Orson Welles is the best. I feel like Citizen Kane is in the, the same realm of, like, Lord of the Rings as far as it being great and everyone being like, yeah, it's a great movie. But then you you have to, like, grab them by the shoulders and be like, no, seriously, this movie is great. Like, yeah. You can't like it's just say it's great. And Watch it. Yeah. Because it's great. Yeah. So, lastly, I have a list of, I think I have the top... Let me see. I have like about 20 here on the website. Where's the jump.com. They have a list of the highest like jump scare movies, like films with the most films with the most oh, jump scares. And some of these you would recognize, I think from, we played a game at our live show with jump scares and the amount of jump scares in certain movies. But, um, I have a list here and I'm curious if you think you could guess. I them. remember the thing being really high in the game. That we it's played. not on okay. here. Okay. Uh, sinister, though. Uh. No fucking way. Sinister is, it is not? not. What? No. Nope. I do see two letters down there, so I'm gonna say it. Yep, the first it. <laughs> it chapter has one has 23. Oh yeah, that's jump that's scares. a bunch of jump scares for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, the projector one's my favorite. I love the projector. That that's another jump scare that I love a lot. Because I think it's so creative, and I genuinely was not expecting him to be fucking gigantic. He's so big. And in my face. <laughs> uh, this is sh- right on my notes. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Kitty. Let's see. Oh, is uh, I don't know. Is one of the. I'm sure there's a found footage in there. Mm, yeah. Is it a paranormal activity? It is a paranormal activity. Three? Nope. Four? Nope. Two? Nope. Not one. Not one. Ghost, or Ghost Dimension. Ghost Dimension. 29 jump scares. That is the third highest. Oh, we did mention that. It's just all lot. jump scares. Yeah. Now, and they're not okay. good. It's funny because I, I, this part got cut off on my notes, but on the website, there is like a star ranking for the quality of jump scares. And oh, that yeah. one is a little bit lower than the <laughs> other ones that are top of this list. Uh, do we have like a Friday the 13th? Any of those in there? Um, no. Oh, wait. Nope. The original. Oh, or- no. Nope, sorry. The remake. The remake. 2009. Which has some good ones, including the, uh, the I'm not actually dead one at the end mm-hmm. is really great when he busts through the dock at the end. Mm-hmm. I, I like that remake. Um, shit. Uh, any nightmares? Nightmares on Elm's streets? No, but. Freddy versus Jason. Freddy versus Jason. Okay. That has hmm. 24. Jump scares. Interesting. Uh, I'm guessing a Halloween, maybe even the first one. Nope. No. Uh, <laughs> Bluesy is all over this. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. I don't know. What do we got? What's the What's the top one? The top one, I wouldn't have expected you to guess. I've never seen this. It has so many fucking jump scares, and it has a pretty good star rating. I guess that these are like solid, and I don't even know if I could watch this movie. The Haunting in Connecticut 2, colon, <laughs> Ghosts of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Is it Connecticut or Georgia movie? Make up your mind. Oh, my God. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. What's, what's going on in that movie? 
<laughs> the Haunting of Michigan, Ghosts of Nebraska. Yeah. Huh? Wow. Number two is Extraterrestrial by Colin Minahan, who also did Grave Encounters. That's why that name is familiar. Okay. We got Resident Evil, the final chapter. <laughs> is that, I, I would bet any money that it's not the last one. Oh, probably not. <laughs> Evil Dead 2, that was one I used in our game that we played, and people were confused as to why that was number one. But, I mean, a lot of these are smaller scares and, or ones that are played to be funny, so maybe they don't register as, like, oh, it's a jump scare. Yeah, but I guess, you know, I guess YouTube registered it uh, as scary because that video just got age-restricted earlier really? today after, like, almost a year of being fine. The Messengers, uh, Haunting oh. in Connecticut. Okay. Insidious has 24 jump scares. Annabelle Creation. Oh, okay. The Those second have one. some good. Drag Me to Hell. Has oh, yeah. God, we had to pause that movie. I, I, I was like, I need a break. There's a lot of jumps <laughs> and I need a break. And that's the thing with that movie is is the jumps that are very well done. Like Ghost Dimension, even though that's higher on this list, I was able to just watch and like fucking whatever. Mm-hmm. But Drag Me to Hell, though it is lower in number, they are so well done and do not let up <laughs> seemingly that I was very I was exhausted by that movie. Yeah. And even on the on where's the jump.com if you go and read their description of the movie it's like these are really well done scares and they're constant like you, like if you're easily startled or frightened this is not a recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Scream 3 is on here. Oh. The Grudge, The Quiet Ones, Banshee Chapter. I've never heard of that. Insidious Chapter 2, Silent Hill Revelation, The Conjuring 2, and the original Evil Dead. Oh, cool. Yeah. So those are high jump scares. High jump scares. Oh, yeah. Still surprised Sinister's not on there. I know, but I wonder if those are more... Quality. Quality over quantity, yeah. Maybe. Those are our, that's our jump scares episode. Yeah. Let us know what some of your favorites are. I know, I want to see... Lit, like I want to see comments with your favorite jump scares. I can think of the first jump scare in a movie that like really got me and that I also enjoyed because it I thought it was fun and I that was a movie where I, I went back to it over and over again was the the original Spider Man, Sam Raimi's Spider Man. It's when um uh, Willem Dafoe is kind of talking to himself in the library of his house because he's being slowly taken over by the Green Goblin and he tries to remember where he was last night because that was when he gets fucking transformed and he goes he's like last night I was and it's just this jump scare to I forget it's I think it, it's either his face looking all crazy or a Green Goblin or something but well, uh, thanks for doing this research and thanks. Uh, what's the site? Oh, where's the jump dot com? Where's the jump dot com? inverse and the verge that was where i got stuff that it was more like the scientific studies and yeah cool mm-hmm. well, good work thank you uh yeah follow dead meat on social media at dead meat james on twitter and instagram and i'm at carebeck c-r-e-b-e-c-c on twitter and instagram and if you want merch deadmeatstore.com mm-hmm. feel free to email deadmeatpod at gmail.com and until next week i'm james i'm charles sorry that email is, is getting a little out of control it's a lot of emails. <laughs> I'm Email joking. it responsibly. Yeah, thank all you. All right, is what we're saying. Now that people are going to do the opposite because you said that. I know. Why Why I'm, are you like this, why are you like, Internet? Why are you like this? Why <laughs> are you like this? I'm James. I'm Chelsea. This has been the Dead Meat Podcast. <laughs>